Alrighty, let's do this. Here we go. We're going to do a, a, basically a summary, a, a overall look at the last chapter of Science 9, and that is on uh, what is known as the interconnection of it all. Actually, that's more uh, my way of talking about it. And what we're focusing on here is what's known as the ecological model, or rather the the science of ecology, which leads us to a lot of other concepts such as sustainability uh, and and the movement of energy on a large, larger scale. Before I get into that, uh, what I really want to do is I want to have a brief, very brief kind of outlook of what has been going on in the entire Science 9 year so that we can get a bit of perspective. I think that's really important. So let's just consider what things have been done up to this point. I've made this kind of nifty little table here, which I think really kind of outlines how all these four chapters relate to each other. And uh, if I had had a chance to teach it uh, in a certain way, in a certain order, this would have been the order, because I think what's interesting about it, um, you'll see very quickly, is that each one builds upon the other. And so ending off with ecosystems is really kind of perfect. If you look at that right off on our on our left side here we have uh, the idea of charges this is basically the physics chapter we're talking about uh, in the realm of the subatomic so we're talking about protons electrons negative and positive charges and how they interact uh, what we generally call electrostatic forces and this is all the stuff we were talking about when we we're saying like charges repel opposite charges attract and and what are all these weird things that can happen as a result of just that simple system and uh, one of the things we were dealing with at the time were circuits but really what scale were we dealing with what how how exactly big is everything and this is something that I think we don't really talk about that much and I could tell sometimes when I was teaching this class uh, people would get a little confused. They would start saying, hey, are, are, are atoms bigger than cells? Are cells bigger than atoms? Like, what, what, how do these things relate? So I think this is what we want to concentrate on here because, first off, uh, you'll notice that when I'm talking about the size of electrons and protons, I'm talking about 10 to the negative 15 meters. Uh, 0 0.00, I'm not even going to count the zeros. It's going to be 14 zeros and then a 1 and uh, a very very small size and when you look at the next stage the next step and when we were talking about atoms and really this is our chemistry our chemistry chapter we're dealing with the realm of the atomic and, and we're really only going from the pieces of an atom to the atom itself but even by going up that one step if you look at that i've absolutely increased the size to 10 to the negative 10. okay 10 to the negative 10 is 100,000 times bigger than the electrons and protons that this thing is made out of. So you got to keep that in mind is that when we deal with atoms, we're not dealing with something that's pretty much on the same scale as the things it's made out of. This is an incredibly big step up. And now we're dealing with things like compounds and uh, chemical reactions. We're interested in how the valence shells of the uh, of the atoms uh, relate to how they are reactive or how they would want to share or gain electrons to become something, well, not not totally different element, but rather uh, get some kind of stability to its system. So valence shells and the need to be stable is part of the rules that we're dealing with. And then as soon as we go from the idea of atoms we move up to cells and this is was the biology chapter that we did and here we're doing once again look at the size 10 to the negative 5 we're dealing with things that are alive or at least by our definition of what it means to be alive there's quite a few rules to or at least definitions that we have now subscribed to being alive it gets murky when we talk about what what makes something alive or what makes something not alive uh, you will hear much a debate among biologists whether viruses are alive or dead. Uh, they do replicate. They do several things that seem to be very alive-y. But uh, whether or not they're alive, you might actually find that people will uh, debate such a thing. Uh, here's where we include things such as cell theory and uh, the concept of DNA, which is nothing more than a very, very long molecule molecule being just simply a combination of a bunch of atoms 
just like we were talking about in the earlier chemistry chapters. So there's a connection there between the living world and the chemical world. Very, very direct connection. And so now we're dealing with things that are uh, sort of systems of multiple cells and cells themselves and how they work and, and, and replicate. Replication was a big thing at the time. And lastly, we get the final chapter. And this is the one, sadly, we didn't have a lot of time with. So I'm hoping that this video is going to cover a lot of those concepts so that in grade 10, you can still make use of this information and, and, and apply it. Um, so here is where we once again bring ourselves out at a much, much larger scale, 10 to the power of zero. In other words, one meter. Size of one meter is where now we're not long, we're no longer looking at single cells. We're looking at the things that cells make up. In other words, the, the creatures and the living things. This can be at a single cellular level, but most of the time with bio, biospheres, we're talking about larger things such as plants, small animals, even large animals. Uh, the whole thing's combined and as well the environment it lives within because the environment that everything is uh, occupying has a direct influence on how uh, things evolve and how things interact with each other. So we have to take into account not just the living but also the non-living things within a system and that's called an ecosystem. We're dealing with a fairly complex model at this point. Now I'm going to get into it. I'm going to talk about that a lot. Uh, I'm not sure how many videos I'm going to make for this thing. Uh, maybe one or two. But first, let's just get this thing out of the way as far as like how these things relate. Uh, and so you notice I'm talking about size. And let's look at that. Each chapter has a scale that is 100,000 times bigger than the one before it. 100,000 times bigger than the one before it. So uh, electrons are 100,000 times smaller than atoms, and atoms are about 100,000 times smaller than cells, and uh, cells are roughly 100,000 times smaller than your average small uh, ecosystem. And here I'm talking about just like a one meter by one meter square of land, or, or it doesn't have to be land, it could be a one meter by one meter square of air. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it'll be a different ecosystem depending upon what I'm looking at. But that is the basic idea. Okay, so here's where we're going to take a little pause, and uh, I've enlisted the help of a friend of mine, April, uh, to sit in with me, and we're going to go through this video. This is not my video. Uh, it's someone else's, and I'll leave a link to the original uh, spot on YouTube for you, and also a link to a different uh, video that actually gets into the, the size of the universe in a little more detail from PBS that I think is really interesting as well. But uh, sit back and be a little entertained for a short while while me and April go through uh, the scale of the universe, which I think is pretty important at this point. Hey, April. Hey. Okay. Right. So yeah. here's what we're going to do. We're going to go down to the small, smallest thing, and then we're going to zoom out. Okay. Got it? Yes. This is all we're going to do. Okay, so we get down to the smallest thing. So um, this is something that I kind of have to talk about a little bit mm -hmm. just to make sure it's really clear. Mm -hmm. And um, the basic idea is that we have this idea about how, say, the world works. Like, if you look at something like a nice curvy thing, if you zoomed in uh, mathematically, you could do that forever. You could just keep on zooming. It'll always be curved. It'll be, like, nice and curvy, and everything will look, well, let's say smooth. Everything will look very smooth. Back in the day, and we're talking about Einstein here, turn of the 20th century is that right turn of the 20th century is that when it starts or ends when you say turn of the 20th century um that's when it starts okay so i'm saying it right yeah okay good so um what they found was that that's not actually possible in the real world in the real world there's a bottom distance there's there's a there, it doesn't go on forever there's an absolute smallest distance and that was that's where we're actually starting in the video okay whoops we're saying that at 10 to the negative 36, so zero point and then 35 zeros and then a nine, you will have uh, the absolute smallest distance that you can have. So what happens is that if you start zooming in at something like this, and I look really closely, at a certain point, it can only be made up of little chunks. Because that's the, that little chunk, that little distance there, like distance for this little piece here, that's the smallest you can go. You can't get any smaller than that. 
it brings up this really weird thing because what it means is that like at the smallest level what would it mean to move because the reason we say something moves is that it goes along like this but we see it moving continuously smoothly across the space but if you say now listen you can only move these distances right this is the smallest distance this has a name by the way it's called a plank length it's the smallest get, they use a little h with a little line through it but if you think about it, that means um say you got a, a little square here i should i should you know what i'm gonna move my square let's go cool okay <laughs> so so what's gonna oh, oh i moved the whole thing here we go so what's going to happen is that it can't go like this. It can't go la nice and smooth. That wasn't mm -hmm. very smooth. Mm -hmm. It's grabbing onto things. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, I'll start here. So I go la smooth, right? Mm -hmm. But it can't. It can't because there is no in between those two distances. At a certain mm -hmm. smallest distance, that's it, which means movement at that point should be something like I'm there and then I disappear and then suddenly I'm, I'm over here. Mm. I've moved that distance. Fun. It's just a little strange. Yet another way of thinking about it is in terms of uh, something maybe you're very familiar with is pixels. So if I look at a picture, it looks very, very smooth. But as it is, if I start going closer and closer, in other words, I zoom in smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually uh, I don't get smoothness anymore. I get uh, pixels. And so this becomes a really interesting thing because back to the idea of movement, uh, if I have an object that is, say, here, and it's going to move to the next place, I am not going to get something moving like this. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is that it's going to be here, then here, then here, then here. There is no in-between, and that's the idea with the Planck length, is that you don't have this smoothness anymore. You almost have things blinking in and out of existence, which is really fascinating. Yeah. But that's what we're starting with. We're saying there's actually the smallest distance you can start with. Huh. So the Planck length, uh, not much at this size. At this point, the only thing that we can really describe uh, are things when we say uh, singularity. You'll often hear things about, like, say, a black hole drops to a singularity. Well, there, there's what we're talking about here, a Planck singularity. It's not actually an infinitely small little point. It's of a Planck length. We zoom out. Notice every square is 10 times bigger than the other square, so we're going enormous distance out now at this point and we're reaching the level of the things that make up uh atoms or rather not even the things that make up atoms but the things that make up the parts of the atoms the quarks so all these things are just the building blocks so we zoom out now notice how we're zooming out we haven't reached anything that we can even talk about yet this is just the stuff that makes the stuff we're more familiar with so here we got the electron see the electron mm -hmm. so that's that's the electron that's the one of the more smaller of the little subatomic particles, but it's part of the atom, right? So now what we want to think about is like, okay, so how much bigger is the proton? Proton's about 2,000 times bigger. So there's the electron. It's now faded. There's the proton. So that's how much bigger that is. Protons, neutrons. So now we're dealing with the nuclei, right? So just a pile of neutrons and protons hanging out. But remember, that's actually a very, very small center of a large atom. So most of it is, as you can see, space there's nothing here helium atoms so there you go so let's just pause again so really if you think about that tiny 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 little nucleus is in the center of this giant ball and there's nothing in between and then just this cloudy electron flying around wow it's quite dramatic <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah we should have some momentous music uh, absolutely sorry uh, <laughs> Anyway, there's DNA, which is just like a big molecule. So now we're dealing with, you know, atoms making bigger stuff. Mm -hmm. And you get some things that start to look a little more recognizable. You got things like viruses, and now we start dealing with the body. So now we zoom out again, and we're at nanometers, and we're dealing with the smallest living stuff. Nanometers is 10 to the negative 9, so we're... You can't see this stuff, but now we can start looking at these things. Now we could use a, a, a very, very strong microscope to see this stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't really have stuff to see anything smaller than that. So now we're dealing with cells, and then your you know actual creatures start to show up. But remember, we're talking about, well, well they look big from this angle. Mm -hmm, but... mm -hmm. 
Not from our angle, though. No, no, because we're only dealing with a millimeter. That tiny square there is one millimeter. So now we got things like sugar cubes and a, you know, well, that's a that's a pretty small frog. I have a hard time <laughs> believing that that frog exists, but exactly. apparently it does. So <laughs> anyway, an egg. Okay. Whoa, that's a big splatter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then we got people. So now we're at our scale. So each square you see there is one meter. That little tiny dinosaur. There used to be tiny dinosaurs. Nice. Well, they do, well, you know, they do come, they did later become birds. So That's right. They, yeah. You'd expect yeah. some dinosaurs to be yeah. bird-sized or at least yeah. getting there. Mm -hmm. Or actual birds. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're all tiny, yeah. you know, pretty small compared to the sea creatures. There's our beautiful blue whale mm. or, or an attempt at making a... And a warplane. Warplanes. <laughs> Don't forget the warplanes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've built some pretty big stuff, right? Like, look at that ship. Yeah. yeah. Mm, it's not bad. Brontosaurus yeah. were pretty enormous. Wow. Yeah, were, yeah, I can't yeah. see the humans anymore. Uh, yeah. It's like by, down there by the car. Oh, oh yeah. check that. A Hyperion tree. Wow, like that's, a, that that's a big tree. Awesome pyramid temple yeah. thing. Oh, we're off yeah. for more planes and we're just into generally big stuff. Yes. The space it. station. Space station is roughly the size of a football field. Wow. So we're still Actually, no, it must be bigger than that. Wow. That looks like a ridiculous... No, there it is. Yeah, kind of... Well, soccer field. Yeah. So here's our largest ships. That's some wow. big ships, yeah. More stuff. Um, the biggest towers... Um, wow. Jetta Tower's not been built yet. And wow. That's, by the way, that's not a building there. That's just a... It's, it's a like waterfall. They, it's a waterfall. It's been <laughs> given a chunk of land to hang off of. Um, now we're dealing with, like, sort of uh, landmarks, right? So Earth still wins. Earth? Because I, of what the do you mean tallest building? Win? Oh, as the bigger oh, I guess stuff. Jetta's oh, the absolutely. only one that's Not bigger. even close. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. don't come close to, yeah. say, Singapore. <laughs> yes. Or the things like that. But notice, um, I just want to bring your... A little note there that that colored object was, a, in fact, a star, hmm. but a special type of star. This is, um, are you familiar with neutron stars? No. So what we're talking about is something that's not quite got enough mass to make itself a black hole. Mm. So it's still, you can still see it because black holes suck the light in. But this is mm. very, very dense, very, very small star. Because it, wow. if you look at it, it's not even the size of the, the Earth. So yeah. it's an incredibly small, compressed amount of uh, star material. That's uh, basically so. It's called a neutron star because it's crammed itself so tightly. You notice how we talked about how you had the the little tiny nucleus and all electrons. Well, that's gone. It's just all bits of nuclei all touching each other. So wow. atoms have broken down at that point. Yeah, it's a weird one. It's a really that's weird. Fascinating. Star. Yeah. So we get out. I want. I don't want to spend too much time here, but we got it. Now we're dealing with more like. I guess cosmological things, mm -hmm. things that although we still have, say, um, yeah, we have moons and stuff. So we're about to see the Earth, and we're going to use that as a reference because we know we got a general idea in our heads about how big the the Earth is. Earth is about roughly twelve thousand kilometers in diameter, so give or take, mm -hmm. you're around there. So we realize what we're looking at now as we pull out, because we should be seeing, say, I guess. Bigger planets. Um, Venus looks like that. Looks like that's Venus right next to us. Mm -hmm. Isn't it Mars in front of us? Yep, yeah, that was Mars. Mars is so much smaller. Wow. Saturn and Jupiter. And now we're just dealing with some bigger stuff. But now we have the sun. Now, just keep in mind now, um, if you can still see the Earth. There it is. There that is the Earth. Is. And there's about a million can fit inside the sun, right? Wow. So we look at the sun. We go, holy cow, that is big. But what we have to realize is that the sun is actually a small star an incredibly small star hmm. um Whoa. so we have a, a number of suns they're going to start looking at our stars that are much bigger wow. right yeah yeah so the north star which is actually a pretty dim star is actually you can see you know yes. how, much, how, much, how, much, how much bigger it is compared to there's our sun incredible yeah it's nutty it's nutty yeah cool 52 million kilometers and then we're like that's not even kicking butt here yeah. What we're really talking about is um, <gasps> pistol star. Oh no! But the, the better one's coming. Whoa. Oh, there it is, Beetlejuice. 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 Um, or do you know where Beetlejuice is? No, oh. I've never seen that. Okay, I I was I like to tell my students how to find it because I think it's cool because you can mm. see you can see Beetlejuice so easily. La la la! This is Orion. This is where you're looking at these stars. Check it out. Middle part is the belt. And right here is Beetlejuice. 
have you seen this? Is that Orion? It is. Woo-hoo. It is Orion. And uh, this is the belt. Yes. Because uh, I think Orion is some sort of archer or something like that. Not just a person yes. going, hooray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Could have so. given him a foot. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Woo. I'm Orion. Yeah. I'm Orion. So, <laughs> I'm Orion, everybody. I'm Orion. Okay, so what we got here is this guy over here. Uh, there's actually a nebula down here, like a star birthing center, I guess. You know, when you have all the dust they're that's so collapsing. Yes. They're very they're very pretty. Yes. They make good photos. If you haven't seen them, you should see them. They're pretty. This one over here, this would be where Beetlejuice is. So that bright star Whoa. you see there, that is, just going back, this monster. Wow. So cool. we're talking a billion kilometers across in wow. size. So this, we're dealing with sizes now where it gets a little harder to think about things. Because remember, Earth we've left behind quite a little while ago. Yeah. Like a million seven. Earths are inside that little thing. Yeah. So yeah. now we're dealing with stars that are on the level of, say, the size of our solar system. Okay. Stuff like that. So this is, this is getting big. Whoa. There's our largest star. Yeah. So we're still dealing Scooty. with okay, Scooty. Hey, what's up, Scooty? Scooty? You're the biggest star in the universe, as far as we know. As far as we, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we got the Kuiper Belt, which is part of our solar system. So all these stars and everything fit inside just sort of our own solar system. What? So this is really, you know, we're like, okay, that's impressive, but you know, there's things that are bigger. So. Um, we got the largest black hole over there. That's a That's happy... significant. Yes, it is. Oh, my yes, goodness. Yes, it is. Black holes can get very big. Um, wow. And now, just pausing again, we're starting to deal with nebulae. Now, nebulae, oh, yes. uh, in case students don't know, um, that's where you've had a star blow up. And that's all the leftover crap flying through space. And as you can see, gomes out really far because this is significantly bigger than any solar system we had, which was way down there. At the bottom. So now we're dealing with uh, distances of uh, a light year. Okay, so, so 9.5 trillion. So now we're going to deal just with distances of light years. So the distance it takes for one beam of light to travel um, over a course of one year. Wow. So keep in mind, uh, it takes light about eight minutes to get from the sun. Yes. We're, we're talking years now. Like, okay, so. Light year. So what do we got at that size? Well, first off, we got the Oort cloud. Um, are you, you familiar with that sucker? No. So the idea is that um, when we're talking about the whole um, birthing uh, stars of all the dust and everything, that's the general idea about how solar systems start, is that you had a whole pile of dust and it kind of collapsed from gravity slowly. And we're talking a long, long time. Wow. But eventually everything just started hanging out together, mutually attract each other. But if that's true, uh, theoretically, that means that a portion of the dust cloud just stayed there because it was too far away. Mm-hmm. So you almost could picture it if you want. You had this whole dust cloud and then this sort of a spherical space just collapsed on itself. But that would mean that there's still kind of this leftover dust beyond that Is hole. Is this the recycling pile of the universe? The recycling pile of the universe? What do you mean by recycling pile of the universe? <laughs> it kind of looks like it, you know, the Oort cloud. Like it's the well, circle it's in the center, right? Yeah, 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 the circle in the center is what the entire... Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like the dirt pile or like the We are the sheet. dirt pile of that that became a star and planets and, and life and all the fun yes. stuff that's here. Good. We're the result of dust collapsing. And the only reason mm. the dust was there is because another star somewhere blew up. Wow. Yeah, it's the only it reason it sacrificed its life for us. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Where it's it's fascinating actually. If you if you think about it, the the distribution from supernovae is exactly how much is in you. Like most of the uh, atoms are in you. Yes. Could only have formed through supernova. You couldn't exist without a star blowing up. We are, if you will. Um, you hear it a lot, but the fact that is is that we we actually are star dust. Yes. Kind of. It's kind of a beautiful thing to see. It is. We're starting us. Animated stars. Animated stars. How nice. So now we're dealing with light years, like 60 light years. This is the largest nebulae we've got. So they go pretty... Think about it now. This, these, these nebulae are traveling across and spending that much time flying away. There you go. 1,500 light years. That's your largest nebula. All from one it looks star like a big blowing up. Booger. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like so. it's the the biggest part of the universe. The cosmological booger. Yeah. Okay. So then we got all now. What we're looking at is just like millions and millions, if not billions, of stars. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And then we get to the scale of our own 
happy little galaxy. This is our Milky Way. This is our Milky Way. This is what? generally what it's considered to look like. That's why we can see it from the ground. It's <laughs> enormous. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, that's actually um, one of the interesting things is that like, um, let me just give myself a new, um, sure. just very quickly here is that it's it's like a pancake, right? The Milky Way is like a pancake. It's also swirly. That has something to do with a little bit of physics and momentum, but it's not important. We know at the center is probably an incredibly large black hole. Wow. So there's probably a massive black hole. We are generally way over here. <laughs> and uh, hit, this this is one of those things that kind of blows me away so okay. if you think about this um, if I looked at it side on it would kind of bulge in the middle a little bit but it'd be something like that it's if a, I was looking from the side it's a giant fried egg giant fried egg and okay. we're over here which means if you look this way you can see sort of it's almost like you're looking across like that right and you, sh you would see that in your sky, and it does actually show up in your sky. It's almost like a brighter part of the sky is where we're looking at into that strip of the Milky Way that we're, that we're inside. Wow. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is that, well, when we look into the sky and we're seeing all the stars that you can see in the sky, let me just draw it here. This is how much of the galaxy you're seeing. That's everything we see with our eyes. La 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 This is the Milky Way. The Milky Way and uh, right there, right there. That is us. That is us. And this little dot is how much of our galaxy we see in the sky. We don't even see close to a hundredth of the entire Milky Way. No, of course not. But like, do we see it's other Milky Ways? Are there well, other Well, we galaxies? actually do see, we do see yeah. one that's close to us. There is one that's close to us, but all the others, no. You'd have to get a telescope. Oh, that's big. Like, and we don't, like, you got to think about it. We don't see this, yeah. like, we don't see any farther than this because nothing's very bright, right? The only reason we see the other galaxy that's over here coming towards us, by the way, <laughs> it's, um, it is, <laughs> it's, it's actually going to hit us. That's terrifying. <laughs> well, we'll be Ooh. we'll be long gone. Oh yes, of course. But uh, if we look that way, we actually do see it um, as a fairly pretty bright thing, actually. Nice. Um, brighter so, and brighter every day. Um, <laughs> eh, I don't think it's going to change that quickly, but you know, we can, we can pretend. Yeah. We can pretend. So anyway, that's that's how much we see. Um, wow. So in fact, let's go back to that. We're talking hmm. um, how many light years? I'm trying to think now. Um, 150 no sorry a thousand what am i trying to say a hundred million well, what, whoa what whoa. happened to the video oh, oh these are all the different galaxies that we know about? now we're talking different galaxies yeah okay. so we're actually in a very small galaxy of course we are, <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> there's nothing like uh like this to put you in your place so now remember i was saying before we were looking at all the different stars in a galaxy we are no longer looking here at stars we're looking at individual galaxies now oh. and we're actually part of a small supercluster it's not the biggest supercluster <laughs> of course but we're part of the uh, Laneka <laughs> supercluster which is a part of another sub subcluster known as the what? Pisces Cetus supercluster complex Whoa. but that is only one of other billions and millions of superclusters so um, at that so point then aliens definitely exist <laughs> well mathematically there's not you know <laughs> I would I would not be a very good of a betting man if I didn't go. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, right. Of course they're out there. Come on. Um, the math is against us to suggest that. Yeah, yeah. we're just oh, the we're only one. Because even I think when people start thinking about well, how many planets are in the galaxy that we're in, mm -hmm. they haven't really taken the time to say, well, wait a minute, this is not the only galaxy. Yeah. And so then you start realizing how many things could be going on in this universe. Wow. Anyway, this is the... Um, we're so demanding of the universe. <laughs> we're pretty demanding. You know, and it's like, we're just a little, little tiny speck of it. Yeah, we are. We're quite mm -hmm. the speck. This is, um, what you're looking at is kind of a bit of a lie. So I just want to say something about this, um, especially if any of my students were looking at this, they might get the wrong idea. Because this implies that the universe is shaped like a ball. And there's an outside of the ball and an inside of the ball and all right. these other things. This is not what you're looking at. Um, okay. First off, whenever we talk about the universe, um, science is generally mostly obsessed with only things that they can be sure are there. So supernatural or beyond the limits of your perception is right out. 
It's just not part of their equation. So when they say this is everything, they just mean this is everything we see. Mm -hmm. There is likely, I well, mean, the odds the are very high. That we're, <laughs> there's much, there is definitely more beyond us uh, from what we see, but we can only see a certain distance. And there's kind of an interesting reason why. Because as you look... Because we're very, very tiny. It's not just we're tiny. It's like... No, tiny is a small part of it. The The biggest problem is that, let's say I'm hanging out on, on Earth, right? And there's a star here and a star here. And they both, at the exact same time, let's say for some weird reason, they both go pop, right? So they go pop. And this one is one light year away. And this one is a light year away from that one, right? Mm-hmm. So what's interesting about that is that you will not have known that anything happened until a year from now. Okay. Because when I see the light from this thing, when I'm looking at light from that, that means it has already taken one light year to get to me. Hmm. So I'm, I'm not just looking far away. I'm looking in the past. Mm -hmm. And at the same time I'm looking at this one, right, it has not gone pop because it's going to take two years to get to me. And I won't even know it did it for another year. Hmm. So when we look farther and farther away okay. at but stuff a we're light also year, looking does that equal a year it takes a year for that information or or visual to get to us okay all right so it's we the actually slowest facts in the universe it's well it's pretty fast <laughs> i mean it's the fastest thing that can get anywhere no but it's absolutely true Informa like when we talk about information they use that a lot in physics to wow. say like i'm not just talking about light but the yeah. information that something's going on takes that long too it doesn't when Newton started doing his old gravity thing, he used to talk a lot about, say, say the sun just disappears. Just, I don't know, magic, right? Sun just goes away suddenly. So now suddenly the Earth has nothing that is pulling itself in a circular motion. There's nothing making it be affected by the gravity because the gravity has gone. Now, according to Newton, the Earth would immediately fly off into space, immediately wow. affected by the fact that there's nothing pulling it in anymore. However, however, the point is, is that no, Einstein showed that no, this is information as well as light, which means as soon as the sun disappears, it will be, like we said, eight minutes before even the earth would be affected by anything. Mm -hmm. That's just blows my mind. The idea that you know, right something can happen, but it will take that much time for something even to be not just aware of it. It's almost like it's aware of it. It's not that it's aware of it. It just doesn't get affected by anything within the limits of that kind of speed. Yes. So when we look further and further away in the universe, we're also looking further and further back in time, which yes. means we actually see to the point of close to the beginning when everything was a little more closer together. Wow. And the problem is, is that as you get closer, um, things start to get hotter. Hmm. So um, when you, when you increase, when you decrease the size of something, you sort of increase the pressure. And if you increase the pressure, you increase the temperature. It's just, that's what happens. And so, uh, there's a point where we can't see any further away or back in time because the light being produced is just everywhere because everything's hot. Mm -hmm. So there's just simply, uh, there's what we sometimes call the orange barrier. There's a point where all the light is just orange. <laughs> So, wow. there's, so there's nothing. There's nothing to see because you can't say I was trying to look at something, but you just I just put a million flashlights in your face. You you wouldn't see past the flashlight. Wow. So yes. Um. Yes. This is the limit to what we can see. Right. This right. is where the orange barrier lives. This is where the, this is where we can see a picture. So what you're seeing here is a projected image of the universe at that time. Right. And what was probably happening. And what interests a lot of physicists is the fact that there's blotches of stuff. Yes. That there is. Because here's the problem. It's like a little math problem. You get everything reduced down to a point and then it's going to expand. So you would assume that when it expands, it would be all uniformly distributed across that surface. Right. Why would Humans it? Humans like that idea. We but like it makes that. sense because mathematically it should. The okay. problem is, is that they look back in time. They go, wait, there's blotches. There's... There's ripples of change happening almost immediately, making clumps. And if you make clumps, you've got galaxies, and you've got galaxies, you've got planets, you've got planets, you've got us. And you kind of got this thing where this was necessary. This is absolutely necessary to have these clumping. But why did it clump? There's no reason why, for it to clump. There's, 
um, some really interesting uh, analysis of this um, that I assume students would get in grade 12 if they kept with this that they could get into about how this actually comes or at least what the theory is at this point about why that happens why we have this clumpy clump clump where I should be seeing really is just everything maybe green or everything yellow or mm. but I'm not seeing that no you're seeing it more like uh, something activated and alive like something activated and alive and like because there if you have anything going through it that causes a ripple then you're going to have I don't know something new happen mm. but the idea is that mathematically it should just come out and go Bleh, you know it's this dull singular <laughs> color thing expanding and everything gets the same treatment and everybody Perhaps math at that scale is more organic than well, we've thought of yet. Math at that scale, the science itself doesn't have, like, at that point, there's no real science behind it at mm. that point. Like, yeah. we, we don't really know what's going on past this. Mm -hmm. There's ideas. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there's anything that's rigorous at this point. It's just, um, yeah, it's the limits of our knowledge. Anyway, um, yeah, that's the video. Oh, that's great. Mm. Any questions? Um, well, no. I feel like, uh, nope. No questions. You just rambled. It was good. It was good. Is it? Yes. It's a, yeah. it's a half hour. All right. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. But what's interesting about that is that we don't, we're not even just simply increasing the size of things. We're also adding to a a sort of complexity of the rules we're using because even though we start off with charges and 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 we have very simple rules that we're starting with although some of the stuff we talked about such as magnetism and everything shows that there is a there is a lot more complexity to it than what we've you know started with there's there's a lot more to it because physics is pretty heavy stuff after a while but we can say we're starting with some simple electrostatic forces but that doesn't get ignored when we start talking about atoms or even when we start talking about cells and ecosystems all of these things still apply you can't just simply throw them out in other words atoms are just simply now electrostatic forces plus the rules of valence shells that must still uh, make use of the electrostatic forces they must still obey those rules so what we're looking at is that each time we move along to another chapter we're looking at an addition to the set of systems and uh, uh, formula that we use to explain the world. So as you can tell, our last chapter, Ecosystems, is going to be an awfully complicated one. There is a lot involved. And, and as a result, there's a reason why uh, Ecosystems has only been such a young science. It's, it's very, very recent that this has even started to happen, and happily, it's being taken incredibly seriously now. Uh, it, it's it's one of the most important uh, sciences out there currently, uh, especially considering the situation we have in our own ecosystem of the world and what's going on and what we need to kind of take seriously that I don't think we really understood before this. Uh, in addition, and there's, uh, as you can see here, I'm talking about the addition of all these different rules, but there is one underlying rule the whole time, and that's energy. The concept of energy is key to everything. And I can't stress this enough, and I, I don't know if I really did a lot during the year when I was teaching this, but I have to stress that energy more than almost anything else is key to how to understand things. For example, if I'm talking about uh, a circuit what really gets a circuit going well if I look at it in terms of a battery all I'm doing is I'm taking some charges and I'm giving them some potential energy and then I let them loose to travel along a wire and they will automatically move from a high potential to a low potential energy that's automatically going to happen uh, if I look at say chemistry and why things react Things will react because they're trying to reach a state of lower energy. If they have very high energy, and I talk about, say, the energy of a system of molecules moving, I can talk about how temperature is related to the kinetic energy, the movement of those atoms. So that that's still very much a point of that. Also, if I had to talk about, if I put a, a hot and a cold liquid together, what happens? Well, the 
kinetic energy of the high moving particles transfers or moves into the world of the cold molecules and they start getting hit and transferring energy among themselves so I'm really still only talking about movement of energy if I talk about cells why are cells doing what are they doing they're trying to get energy from other sources other uh, energy sources such as say the Sun or other uh, nutrients or chemicals the movement of chemicals the movement of energy is key to all this and it absolutely uh, applies to the concept of ecosystems very much so and we're going to talk about that a lot um, just how that works so every single time this concept of energy is something that I, I really uh, cannot help stress enough that you should focus on in trying to understand because energy can be a very complex subject uh, it uh, it's not one of those ones where hey here's the equation now that's all you need to know uh, for example there's a number of equations that you can use for energy depending on what kind of energy you're talking about uh, for example if I'm talking about uh, let me see whoops wrong if I'm talking about kinetic energy ke there is an equation in physics one half mass times my speed squared uh, if I talk about potential energy uh, it could be uh, the mass of an object times the gravitational uh, acceleration times the height from uh, from the ground or from some other point I could also talk about the potential energy or of a spring which is one half kx squared there's a lot of equations I can use um, there's even more there's 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 lots more potential energy uh, equations I can talk about the thermal energy of something I can talk about the uh, solar energy I can talk about electrical energy all these things have different equations so what I'm trying to get to you here is that no matter what um, energy is primarily about uh, the transference of some quantitative value but the form of the energy is there's a multiplicity there, there's a lot of different ways that energy can be formed and so a lot of what we're talking about is either the movement of energy from low to high or high to low usually high to low naturally it, it but we can force it to go the other way or it can be about the transformation of energy for example here I am I got my hands I move them very quickly and then I slap them together and immediately I feel the heat from that slapping of hands together I hear the sound so I've changed movement energy the energy of the moving of the hands to a sudden a, a burst of energy into both heat and sound uh, and and so this is constantly happening in our world and it's key to how things actually are alive if you don't have movement of energy you will not have things being alive the reason why the earth is such a great ecosystem is because that we have a constant fluid motion of energy throughout its system that really is key so let's talk for a moment about uh, ecology and why I think it's a really, really important science. And I say that being a physics teacher, but gosh darn it, you really should take ecology very seriously, especially in, uh, where we are currently in history. Uh, it, it's a big thing. And I'm going to give you two examples of why we need to get a just a tad more on the ball when it comes to uh the creating a really good ecological model because in the past we have really really ignored that I'm gonna give you two examples uh, this one is a place called let me see let's find the name here I just had, I had to write it down because I couldn't remember how to spell it but it is known as the Matt uh, Matt Curry I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that it's this is how I say it Macare Island and uh, it is eh, it's about there it's about there it's a little tiny island uh, this was uh, discovered in 1810 uh, way back in the day this is an, a beautiful picture of the beach there isn't it nice oh it looks so pretty and uh, in 1810 uh, they came there and they found that there was lots of uh, well lots of seals and lots of penguins you can even see them down on the coast there like hanging out lots of penguins hanging out not sure if I've got the right penguin don't don't hold me to it because that's a that's a bearded seal and that's a emperor penguin I don't know if it's those ones down there eh, it could be but I I don't know I'm not this is where my ignorance and biology come out pretty hard 
But here's a, here's an interesting. It's a good example of an ecosystem gone wackadoodle because people did not really have a clear understanding of how things are interconnected. This is key to the ecological model, and what makes it so complicated is that we have this. So far, uh, humankind has had a real dumb attitude <laughs> towards how to deal with these things. So, for example, uh, in this case, uh, the ship uh, that came. Uh, basically uh, had uh, some rats and the rats went onto the island. Now this was accidental. This is just because ships have rats and the rats, as soon as the ships got close enough to the island or brought on some stuff from the ships, the rats came along with them and started invading the island. Immediately started uh, populating the, the place. Now, at the same time, uh, they brought in some the 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 what would i call them the sealers yes these were sealers uh brought on some rabbits they brought on rabbits uh, and kept them in cages uh in order to have some food uh they weren't about to go eat in the grass on the island they didn't have any other way of getting food and so since they're there for a while to kill all the seals uh which by the way very quickly became an eradication of the seals <laughs> that was dumb but there you go so very quickly the sealers come by and they start going ah i'm gonna kill you seals ah so they start killing all the seals. Now, the penguins are fine. No one wants the penguins anyway. They were just kind of these dopey little strange things, and no one cared. Now, what happened is that the rats start running amok in the island because there are no predators for the rats. And the rabbits escaped some of their pens and immediately started breeding like bunnies. And the rabbits, which were originally just brought in for food, begin overpopulating ridiculous overpopulating and so this becomes a problem when the sealers are there and they're noticing that the island is starting to have a lot of problems uh, they feel bad so they bring and introduce cats yep they bring in some cats so what happens uh, they, they let loose some cats to be natural predators to both the rabbits and the rats now this sort of works so initially uh, rabbits start decreasing in population. The rats start po decreasing in population. I should mention that on top of the the birds, well, actually, we're going to have to start talking about the penguins, but also the seabirds. There's a ton of really uh, beautiful seabirds on the island. I haven't included a picture of them. But the cats start uh, wiping out everything and overpopulating the island as well because nothing's stopping them. They wipe out seabirds at a rate get this 60,000 birds per year very quickly eradicating the island of all of those now what they decide to do then is because <laughs> because people are idiots they go okay here's what we're going to do we're going to have to go on the island and get rid of all the cats so there was a what we call a cull a cull means basically running around with a bat and bashing the crap out of every single animal you see. So this was basically a, a chase to destroy all the all the cats. Now they they managed to drop the uh, the population of cats, uh, which meant yes, you guessed it, because what am I saying? I'm saying that everybody's an idiot. So yes, absolutely, everybody's an idiot here. Uh, the rats start coming back the rabbits start coming back because now the enemy is gone and so they immediately start overpopulating again now this becomes kind of interesting because what happens is that the rabbits now start eating all of the there's so many of them that they're eliminating all the soil connections of roots in the plants because they're eating all the plants and now the, the root systems are dying now this is kind of fascinating is that as the rabbit increases, they start eating all the roots, the, the grass and root systems, which leads to enormous amounts of soil erosion and the cliffs that have all these seabird uh, nests and uh, the nests below for the penguins all get destroyed uh, constantly because the soil keeps dropping away. Because this is where the seabirds were protecting themselves was by putting nests along the cliff faces. But now because the rabbits were eating all the plants, the soil was giving away and that was falling apart. So basically they had to go back and had to start <laughs> trying again to wipe out 
the rabbits. So they had to kill all the rabbits. So another cull came in, basically a bunch of humans coming in and uh, destroying every single rabbit they could see. Uh, they didn't do so well with the rats. The rats are still, there's, there's, there's some rats destroyed, but they managed to stick around. The penguins now are more or less okay. I don't think there's seals on the island anymore. Uh, but basically, uh, just a moment to think about what was happening there. Uh, constant attempts by humans to involve themselves in an ecosystem that they clearly did not understand at all did not understand at all and and therefore led to massive massive problems throughout now what else could we need to talk about there's one i want to talk about because i think this is a great example of once again people just not understanding uh how things work and this is uh communist china in the 50s now this is quite a long time ago but this is a fascinating story now, uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, around 1949, we have the uh, introduction of communism to uh, China in terms of Mao Zedong. And uh, Mao Zedong uh, was uh, kind of keen on creating a large cultural shift in uh, the country. And, he, and, he, and I'll say this, is that a lot of what he was trying to do at the time was actually do good uh, in this case. And you're going to see these cool posters uh, if you notice this. He had a plan because there was a lot of infectious disease going on throughout the country. And so uh, they had several steps of how they were going to deal with infectious disease because it was killing massive amounts of people. This was not a small problem. This was something that had to be dealt with and to his credit, dealt with it uh, with the best of intentions. And the first thing uh, and the first most successful thing was to do mass vaccinations. 300 million people all vaccinated for plague and smallpox, which immediately uh, stopped the spread fairly quickly to the younger generations. Um, and this, this did enormous, uh, enormous good to the country. Now, the only problem is that then Mao Zedong in the 50s, around 1958, introduced a new campaign, which once again, this was with the best of intentions, <laughs> but it was also once again, just like the the Macare Islands uh, really done without any clear understanding of how ecology works and so what happened is that you can see here on the on the left poster here uh, the plan it was basically uh, we've got the vaccinations out of the way let's now deal with the source of the problem and so Mao Zedong decided these are the there's four pests four things that we are going to wipe out of this country and therefore save us having the spread of disease. Now, he uh, basically, you can see here, mosquitoes were considered to be the source of malaria. Uh, flies, I'm not sure what they were concerned about with flies. I think, I think the idea was that they felt that flies were spreading disease just because they were dirty and they were hanging around a lot of poop. They, flies seemed to like poop. Uh, rodents uh, were understood as being the spread of plague. And sparrows, sparrows are an interesting one because sparrows were considered a pest because they ate crops. Now, they, sparrows were known to eat seeds, and so the idea was that the sparrows were causing untold damage uh, simply by uh, eating all the seeds and also had to be eradicated. So this became a widespread, countrywide culling of all these four pests and that's why i got that little picture over here everyone running around killing every <laughs> yay we all shot the one sparrow actually they didn't just kill one sparrow let's get into like the numbers here because they were incredibly effective at the time this is a 1958 uh incredibly in fact effective at getting rid of a lot of stuff so mosquitoes 11 million kilograms i don't even know how many are in one kilogram of how many mosquitoes does it take to get a kilogram of them in a box i have no idea it must be an enormous amount but apparently they wiped out 11 million kilograms of mosquitoes they got rid of 1.5 billion rats they got a hundred million kilograms of flies but the thing i want to focus on here is the idea of the sparrows now they were really good at getting rid of sparrows i mean all they had to do was like you see in the poster there shoot them every time you see a sparrow kill it so were they successful absolutely one billion one billion sparrows now uh 
Here's where things went drastically wrong. Because once again, what is ecology about? Ecology is about the interconnection of species. So, what do sparrows do? They eat seeds. Yes. Is that all they eat? No. In fact, what happened here is a realization of the one other thing that sparrows eat. Locusts. Yep. That's the big thing. They basically were the main predator of locusts. So, what happened? What do you think happened? Well, with no natural predator of the locust, the locust went crazy and went overpopulating, went out and wiped out crops, wiped out crops right across China. Um, it was devastating, devastating. 20 to 30 million Chinese starved to death, starved to death between 58 and 62. It was a huge disaster. Uh, to his credit, Mao Zedong actually recognized this as a problem, tried to reintroduce sparrows, but it was really much, much too late. Um, it just goes to show that uh, we need to have a better understanding of how these things work. We really need to gather ourselves with a system that can accurately show how everything is interrelated, interconnected. And that's why this, this entire chapter is called that. It's, it's why we're talking about the interconnection of it all. This is, this is a, a, something that has to include all sorts of things. We, we, we can't just simply include, say, the living things. Ecology is an attempt to model an entire ecosystem and how it all connects. We're talking what we call biotic factors, which is all the living things, but also all the abiotic factors. Uh, so, just a, as a quick understanding, uh, air, grass, uh, kitties, uh, rocks, all these things have to be included into our model. So, the model is going to be fairly complex. So, you can see why this probably never came about until recently as a real science because of the intense complexity that would be involved in really trying to combine all these things into one single model. You can use a simple model uh, to, to look at the, sort of the possible ways in which life can evolve or change or affect each other, but we don't have something yet that includes every single uh, factor, but it is what we're aiming for. So definitely a science that is in its infancy, but uh, ripe for people like you to get involved in and really kind of... Uh, put it in a position where it can actually make real change to the world. And I think that's what's really interesting about it. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there for my first chapter. This is just sort of a summation, uh, getting us started on what we're going to talk about. We're going to move right into the source of all energy, uh, the sun in the next chapter. And I'll talk a bit about like how that can affect everything. But for now, uh, let's leave it at that. I hope that gave you something to think about. Talk to you later.